Good morning, church. Uh, I don't know about where to start, but I bless God for being here this morning, and I bless God for Pastor Carl, because this is also a sign of love and the trust, just to invite me to come to stand here and to speak to the congregation where God put him as a, a shepherd to watch, and then not even being in town, that uh, it meant a lot to me. And uh, if you've been in this church for the past three years, that means you know me. And my, my name is Patient Kabuya Matadi. And if you are new, that means uh, nice to meet you. Uh, uh, one more thing. A lot of things didn't really change. Um, I'm still married to the same girl uh, with a zero intention of uh, divorcing. We still have two girls. I think we're done by then. No more miracles. Nothing surprising. And then lastly, I still have an accent. <laughs> this is a part of the thing that didn't change. I'm a, originally from Congo. I speak seven languages, but I focus more in French. Um, I, I'm going to be very honest with you that even when I'm talking to you, the truth is in my brain that think in French, and, uh, and I try to translate that as fast as I can and say that to you. And yeah, this is how it works. With Lingala, Swahili, Chiluba, Kikongo, you just put all of them together. But it doesn't make me uh, special. I always say that when I talk about languages, in my country, we have about 400 of them, and it's okay if someone speaks more than 10 languages. It's just no more. It doesn't make you smart or nothing like that. I always say, by the way, I'm not very smart. I'm just very curious. That, that's something about me also. Uh, today, we're going to be in the book of John, John chapter 12. And the pastor Carl asked me to cover from verse 12 and they're going down. I think we're going to cover from 12 to 23. Um, I know that you guys are doing the journey. I was with him, uh, I think, a week ago. We went to uh, Oregon together. We spent the time with him, and then he even told me that uh, you guys are doing the journey in the book of John. To be honest, only Pastor Carl can do it because I don't know when you guys are going to finish the book of John, but that's your, I'm going to do my part today, and I'm going to be going, oh, by the way, yes, I'm also a pastor at a church called the Garage Church. We used to meet in a garage, but we're not in a garage anymore, but we kept the name, uh, the Garage if you ask me why, I don't know, but people think it's cool. But I say, okay, fine, if it's cool, let's do it. And then, yes, if you have your Bible, please, I would like you to have your Bible. And I would love you to keep your Bible open. Um, uh, I don't really preach very well with uh, PowerPoint, but I'll try to do it because I'm just a speaker. I like just to talk, and, and we're going to do it. I'm going to read a couple of verses, and we can continue. Verse 12. Uh, yeah, verse 12. The next day... When the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and they went out to meet him. They kept shout, they, uh, okay. they keep shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and they sat on it as it's written, fear no more, daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming sitting on a donkey cart. Amen? Man, like I said, I want you to keep your Bible open because we're going to really do the journey maybe to verse 23 if we have time because we need to finish on time. Now, there's one thing that I want you to know already about the passage that I just read. This is a one of the stories that you're going to find in all four Gospels. You'll find it in Matthew, you're going to find it in Mark, you're going to find it in Luke, and you're going to find it in John. It's not all of them. Now, in a sense where it's not all the gospel that they talk about the same story. The only reason is because they approach the history of or the story of Jesus in a different perspective. Now, Matthew, for instance, approached Jesus as a king. Because he was written, he was writing to the Jew people, he actually talked to them about Jesus being the king. And you can notice that in the genealogy, the way he explained that Jesus was the son of David and he was the king of a Jew, that they were expecting. Now, when you talk to Mark, when you read Mark, you're going to notice one thing of book of Mark. Look like Jesus never ever time to have a breakfast or even brush his teeth. Because everything in the book of Mark is about, and then 
and then, and then. He's writing to the Roman people because they are hard worker. They are kind of like American people. They don't like details, just go straight to the point. This is Mark. Now, when we talk about Luke, Luke is the only gentle who actually wrote. He wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And you can see that the way he's writing. He's giving more details, but he's also bringing the humanity of Jesus Christ to the table. Why? Because the first century have a dispute. The church have a dispute on if Jesus was only God or Jesus was only a human being. Some people think that he was 50% God and a 50% human being. Some people think that he was 100% God. Some people think he was only 100% a human being. But this is why Luke came to explain one aspect of Jesus Christ's life, which is he was 100% God and he was 100% a human being. And he show us the humanity of Christ in that aspect. Now, when he become about John, I don't know what John did, but he was totally different. John didn't focus in every other details like other people. John went straight to explain to us that Jesus Christ is God. That's why you see the intro in John chapter 1. He started by telling us, in the beginning it was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, the part that I love the most is the Word, the Word took a flesh and they dwell among us with a lot of grace. This is John. Now we are in chapter 12 of book of John, but John have 21 chapters. But in chapter 12, John is telling us already the last week of Jesus Christ as a human being on earth. That means close to 55% of the book is just covering one week of Jesus Christ's life. They have to show you the importance of why John is really focused on that aspect of Jesus going to die for you and I. And they cover that in 50%, more than 55% of that. That from chapter 12, go down to 21, is just talking about Jesus being arrested and go being crucified. And we're not going to leave him in the tomb. He needs to come back after three days. This is what John is doing. But we're talking about a... The story, the story that we talk about, that we believe that Jesus is the king, and I'm going to try my best to cover these three points. The first one is the praise. The second one is the one who fulfilled all the prophecy. And then the third one, it's going to be others and I. And then we're going to go to the first point. The first point, we talk about the praise. The Bible is telling us that Jesus was in Bethany, which is about five to seven miles away from Jerusalem. But this is the period of one of the most important events in the life of a Jew people. They call that the Passover. That means every Jew person needs to go there during the Passover. It happened once a year. No matter where you are, people were going to Jerusalem for the Passover. The Passover, we can see it the first time in the book of Exodus. When God is actually releasing his people from the slavery in Egypt, and they ask them to be ready. They're going to be living that night where they send the angel to come to kill all the firstborn, except in a Jew family. It was the day of the Passover. And then now the Israel people, they celebrate that every year. Even Jesus Christ, by being Jew, he went up to celebrate that. But you heard me saying that he went up. I love geography and I love history. The truth is, when you check the map of Israel, you'll notice that Jerusalem is in the south. Now, normally when we talk, we always say, I'm go when you go north, we always say, I'm going up. When we go south, we always go there, I'm going down. But when you hear the Israel people or the Jew people talking, they always do that backward. They always say, we're going up to Jerusalem, even though Jerusalem is in the south. The reason that they do that is because God by then, you can find him only in a temple. And then every time they were going to the temple to be with God, even though it was going down, for them it was going up. That means all I'm trying to tell you here is this. No matter what you're doing in your life, no matter what you're going through, as long as you are with Jesus, even if you think in your mind you're going down, make sure you're going up. Believe me. Because Christ is there. Everywhere God is, when you go to that direction, even so it's hard, it's complicated, you feel like you don't see the way, believe me, you're going up. This is how the Jew people, they were always saying that. But now, we're talking about people going everywhere, every year to Jerusalem. 
Now, there was one scholar that I was reading. He talked about that. He said, one of the Passover, I don't know if it was this one or another one, they were able to kill close to 250,000 lambs. Now, the law also say, if you want to bring a lamb to the temple, you need to make sure that the family is at least 10 people to eat one lamb. That means if we do the math, which I'm not very good on, when we do 10 times 250, that means we have an idea how many people there were in Jerusalem by then. We're talking about 2.5 million people. Now, it's not like today, where we have hotel everywhere. We have uh, shared, what do you call it again? Vacation places, the short time, or all those kind of things. No, by then people were going and that they were sleeping on the street. They were there just because this is what's very important to them. But this event also is taking place in the month of Nisan. No, they write that exactly like they call Nisan, but you take one eye off. It was happening in the month of Nisan. But this event, the one we read now, is taking place on the 10th day of the month of Nisan. But what is so particular in that day? This is the day where that the Jew culture or a Jew family were going to the market, check this, to select the lamb that they're going to kill in four days for the forgiveness of their sin. That means they need to buy it four days early. And this is the day that they were going in the market to select. The reason that I didn't use the word to buy, because if you go buy, you can buy whatever you want to. But when it becomes about this, you're not going to buy anything. You need to select a good one because your lamb needs to be just perfect. But the law says when you select one, you need to take them in your house. And they need to live with you for three days, not outside, not in the backyard, but in your house. You need to do, you have three days to check the lamb and to make sure that the lamb is just perfect. Perfect to be offered to Yahweh. And that you have three days to live with that lamb in your house. And that this is what's happening on the 10th of the month of Nisan. Now, if you are me and you and I, you're going to record that Jesus doing miracles. Every time he was doing miracles, he didn't want people to make noise about it. More than once, Jesus told people, don't tell nobody about this. It happened even Jesus did a miracle. He asked the person, do not go back to the village. Because he didn't want anyone want to know about this. Except here. Here we're going to see Jesus actually putting a show, doing all the events. He do the things for the attention to be on him. It seems like he knew the ramification that it's going to be in this day if he decided to do what he's going to do. What he's going to do, he's going to leave Bethany, which Pastor Carl covered last year, last Sunday, when he was talking about Lazarus. He was at the Lazarus house. He was leaving Bethany. Now he's going to Jerusalem. We talk about five to seven miles away. We don't have an idea, but the Bible say people heard that Jesus was coming. If it's today, I get it. I see that on Instagram. It was on Facebook. But then I have no idea how they heard that Jesus was coming. I don't know. All I know, the Bible is telling us that they heard that Jesus was coming and that the Bible said they went and they took the branch of the palm tree and that they start coming and they're screaming and they're shouting, Hosanna. I want you to understand that. Why? Because the Jew people, by then they heard about Lazarus who was dead already. Four days later, Jesus was able to bring him back alive. This guy must be amazing. He's actually the king that we were waiting for for a very long time. We didn't have a king. By the way, he's coming from Judah. He comes from the house of David. This must be the king. Oh, they were right in that time. But they were wrong about the mission of Jesus Christ. Because for them, the thing that he was coming to set them free from the Roman people. That this was not Jesus' plan. Jesus came come to set them free from the life of sin. Why Jesus did it? Because Jesus wanted the crown. But Jesus realized one thing. I cannot get the crown of glory if I don't go by the cross. I want you to tell you today, the majority of us, we want to succeed in a certain area of our life. But none of us want to go by the cross. But Jesus realized that. I always explain that by saying, everything that is happening, God the Father is actually putting a move in place. Where he's giving people each role they want to play. In that movie, 
And then Jesus raised his hand. He said, Father, I'm the one that I want to die for those people. I'm telling you the truth. I don't want to die even for myself. But Jesus decided to die. Because I don't trust myself. I don't know how I'm going to react about some stuff. But Jesus decided to die for me and to die for you. Not even knowing that one day you're going to decide to give your life to him. But he decided to do it. Now the people start to shout, screaming, Hosanna. Hosanna means come and they save us, but save us now. Save us not because of life of sin, but save us because we want you to become our king. So the Roman people, they're going to leave us alone. But that was wrong. The truth is Jesus will come back. The book of Revelation is telling us he's going to come to set them free. But for now, he didn't come for that. He came to set them free from the life of sin. Because what Jesus wants to deal with, he wants to deal with our inside. He just doesn't want to deal with everything that is going around us. Yes, those people that they were shouting Hosanna. Five days or a week from that day that they were standing, shouting Hosanna, there will be the same people, the same crowd that's going to cry also, crucify him. That's why I say it's easy. It's easy to shout, to scream with the crowd than to stand by the cross. Than to really stand by the cross. It's very easy to shout with the crowd. Hey, Hosanna, 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 set us free now. Why, why they're crying that Hosanna? It's because they're calling, actually, the book of... Uh, I, I, sorry, I need to slow down. <laughs> Ezekiel, that is talking about that. The calling that they say, Hosanna, we're blessing God. You coming now, please, can you set us free? But they confuse the kingship of God. They don't have an idea about what the king actually, Jesus came to do. Jesus didn't come to set them free from the Roman. He came to set them free from the life of sin. Do you know that sin is the cause of every trouble that we live in today? It's actually sin. Sin is the reason of all the division that we're having today. Sin is the cause of every wars that you see today. Today in the news, we're just talking about what's happening in Russia. I'm not doing politics here with a Ukrainian, whatever, but this is a result of a sin because somebody thinks that is better than everybody else or you have more power than everybody else. We talk about what's happening in the east of Congo for the past, what, 25 years, babies and women being raped. This is because somebody thinks that I have the power and that this is the result of sin. And the Jesus come and they say, this is what I want to deal with. Because if I can deal with your inside, you're going to produce the result, which is going to be the fruit of repentance, so that your outside will be blessed. Yeah. Zechariah 9, 9 is talking about it. He said, rejoice, you daughter of Zion. When we talk about daughter of Zion, it's just another way of calling Jerusalem. He said, rejoice, daughter of Zion. See your king is coming, riding on a donkey. What I'm trying you to understand here, this is a prophecy that was written more than 300 years ago that Jesus is fulfilling on that day. But pay attention on this. Jesus didn't read the book of Zechariah, say, now I'm going to do this because I read that. No, Jesus is fulfilling it because the prophecy was really about him. It's not because he read something somewhere. By sharing Hosanna, that is the greatest need of a human being. It's a freedom. But for me, patient, the greatest achievement that God did on the world, it was not to create all of this, but it was to send Jesus Christ. You know, as a human being, we need freedom in every area. Actually, when we talk about the freedom, I think America is the best country to understand it. The world, that all the worlds that we have, we go, we fighting for freedom. We want to be free. That is the greatest need that we want. But I'm going to tell you, the greatest achievement that God did is what's sending Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the only one can, send, can set us free. Because the idea of freedom is great. But living freedom, only God can do that. I, Paul, Apostle Paul understood that very well. He's writing a letter. He says something amazing. He said, the good that I want to do, I cannot do it. The evil that I don't want to do, I always find myself doing it. That means I have, I'm full of good ideas, but I don't know how to put it in action. But the question is the most important in that verse. Paul never asked the question, how? 
we ask the question, who? The who is the person of Christ who's coming to set us free. This is the greatest achievement that God did for humanity. It was to give us Jesus. To come and to set us free. Because yes, I'm telling you, I, I was talking to somebody yesterday over the phone. This is not even part of my notes, but it came to my mind now. I was talking to someone over the phone and he told me he was back home in Congo. And we were talking about something. He told me, but you don't understand that Congo is going very well, all those kind of things. I was in Congo in January. I told him, man, you have no idea about what you're talking about. You have no idea. Because the only way you can say Congo is going very well is if I take you there and I bring you where I am so you can compare to. But because you are there and you make suffering to become normal, part of your life. What I'm trying to say here is what? We as a human being, we are full of good ideas, but we don't have a power to apply those good ideas in our life. Except when we invite the person of Christ in our life to be our savior and to be the king. Because the majority of us as a Christian, we love Jesus to be the savior. We love that part, but we don't want him to be the king because the king is the one that lead us. The king is the one telling us what to do, how to love even our enemies. But it's great when we just, just when he is the savior. But when he become a king, we don't want that power of him. Because the truth is, when he become the king, he's going to tell us how to dress, how to talk to people, how to be nice, how to bless our enemies. Who want to do that? No one. So that God, do me a favor. Can you just be my savior? And then let me rule my life the way I want to? Even when they were crying, Hosanna, come to set us free now. The problem is, well, we don't want the Roman people anymore. But we don't want to follow your rules. We don't want to follow your rules. But just come to help us by kicking these people out. Where they're crying, Hosanna. That the truth is there. Because when they realize that he didn't come to set them free from Roman people, one week later, there were the same people, the same crowd, were also there and they're crying, crucify him. Because finally we didn't get what we want. That's why we want to crucify you now. That is the greatest need. If you have that need to be set free in every area of your life where you're struggling, in your marriage, in your, with your kids and with all those kind of things. I don't know, with your work, your job, your, your relationship with your coworker. No matter where each area you're struggling today, my free advice for you is going to be, can you invite Jesus? Because he's the only one who can really set you free or make your great ideas to become a reality. I'm telling you, the majority of us, we are full of good ideas, but we don't know how to put that in action. Now, when I'm talking about those good ideas, you're going to see, if you, that's why I say keep your Bible open. When you open Zechariah 9.9, check how Zechariah 9.9 started. The prophecy that John is talking about in Zechariah 9.9, it started by saying, rejoice greatly. But when you go in the book of John, John is saying, fear no more. That means the same prophecy, two different intros. But it's the same prophecy everywhere. Except the intro, the word changed. The reason the word changed is because John realized that Jesus didn't come to set us free from the Roman people. He came to set us free from the life of sin. Great, rejoice greatly because they were rejoicing with a palm trees because they think now we are free from the Roman people. John said, no, 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 we didn't get it, even us. He came to set us free from that. That's why I love the verse 16. In verse 16, he's talking about something. In verse 16, he's talking about something. Let me check that in my Bible so I make sure that I'm not saying. Uh... Yes, in verse 16, he's talking about something. He said, even us as a disciple, we didn't get it by then. That means everybody were just grateful because they were so in a joy because they think that Jesus came to set them from the Roman people. They didn't really get it. They didn't. And you know the reason that I love it? It's because even me, sometimes I realize that there's a lot of things that I don't get it. I don't get it why I'm reacting the way I act. I don't get it why I do what I'm doing. But I like the way John finished that sentence. Until one cross was glorified. Today I want to tell somebody something. It's okay if you don't get it. But if you want to get it very well, you need to let Christ to be glorified in your life. When Christ is glorified in your life, now the two people that were there, they said, whoa, we know about all of this. Man, 
Do you understand that to be a Pharisee or to be a Jew, you need to memorize the Torah. That means they memorize everything. Even though those things was happening in their presence, they didn't get it. You know why they didn't get it? Because they didn't let Christ to be glorified in their life. Oh, I don't want to open the, my closet of my marriage or everything. But I think more and more day and day are becoming a more and a better and a better husband and a better and a better father. Do you know why? Because in the, that area of my life, I let Christ to be glorified. When he was full of myself, yeah, I was doing the things that I want to do. I want to lead that the way I want to lead that. And you have no idea how many troubles that I found myself. In my relationship with others, I've been in a lot of troubles because I cannot keep my mouth shut. Until I realized one thing. I need to let God get glory in this area of my life. So I'm going to learn. Even to apologize when in my mind I think I was just right. But in the name of peace, for the glory of God, let me just say sorry for what I did. Or if sorry because I hurt you. The disciples, they didn't get it from the beginning. And you know what is happening here? Even the Pharisees, until today, they never got it. Why? Because they never let Christ be glorified in their life. Which is that area of your life that you're struggling with. I'm inviting you to invite Christ to be glorified in that area. You learn. I'm not saying that I'm a perfect husband or an amazing father. No. But I realized that more inviting Christ in that area, more I let him to be glorified, more actually enjoying life. Because it's not just me about me, myself and I. The way I think that I'm going to do it, and it needs to be done this way. And I loved that part when I saw it. I said, wow, even John, even Peter, Matthew, Thomas, they, they were there, and they didn't get it. Oh, don't be shocked if you don't get it now. But just let Christ to be glorified in that area. Which area? I don't want to know. But you know the area. And then let Christ to be glorified in that area. So you will see. You will see the things clear. Because what's going to happen when you let Christ to be glorified in that area? You're going to discover who Christ is. When you discover who Christ is, now you're going to discover who you are. The biggest problem that we have in this generation is a crisis of identity. We have a problem. Who am I? You are who you are if you discover who Christ is because by then it's going to tell you who you are because he's your maker. This is what is happening. That's why did John marked the difference between the way Zachariah started the prophecy and the way he approached the prophecy. Now the question is going to be why the donkey? Do you know that the whole Jesus life, he was walking everywhere? I always bless Jesus, man, that he was born 2,000 years ago. If I was Jesus, the son of God, I'll be born in 2050 when all the car is electric. I can drive it by sleeping. I'm just in a car. Car, take me home. I'm sleeping. Why do I need? And by the way, where, if I was Jesus, why I need to be born in Palestine? Do you have an idea about the weather there? That take the weather of Fresno in July times five. Why do I need to go born there? I'm going to born in one of the paradise. I don't know, somewhere. Do my miracle from there. Sending you that by fax machine if you want. I'm, I'm okay. If I was Jesus, I'm going to Zoom all of you guys. I don't want to meet you. Just log in a Zoom. What is your problem? Receive your miracle. Go home. <laughs> what, what do I need to? But Jesus did it, man. Born in that Palestine. It's super hot. There is no car. Sleeping on the street. People following me everywhere. Touching me. And by the way, they're also following me. And I need to feed them too. We talk about 25,000 people here. What do I need to do that? First of all, I didn't invite you. You following me. Now I need to buy your food. <laughs> no way. But do you get it? That just to tell you, I cannot be Jesus. <laughs> it's going to be terrible. <laughs> I cannot. But he did it. He came. He came. But the Bible is telling us that he decided to come from Bethany to Jerusalem in a donkey. Now, I want to, pull, to bring two things here. First of all, in a Jew culture, when the king was visiting a country or city or somewhere in the name of peace, he was riding on a donkey. If he's coming for a war, he was riding on a horse. 
But there's also another aspect here. Exodus chapter 13, verse 13. I'm going to give you a minute. Open your Bible from where you are because I want all of us to read that. Because we're going to try to get an answer why Jesus decided to ride on a donkey on that day. I remember, I told you that it was on the 10th day of a month of a Nissan. But this one, are you there already? If you're there, you can just raise your hand so I'm going to know. You are there? Okay, check what's happening here. In a Jew culture, when a donkey gives birth, they were taking the firstborn of the donkey and then they need to kill him immediately. Except, if the owner of the donkey say, my donkey looks so cute, I want to keep my donkey, in that case, what you have one thing to do, you need to take a lamb and they kill the lamb to replace the life of a donkey so you can keep your donkey alive. Now, this is the day, what we call the 10th day of a month of Nisan. It's the day that the Jew people go to the market to select the lamb that they're going to offer to God for the forgiveness of their sin. This is also the day that Jesus decided to come to Jerusalem riding on a donkey. I don't know if you're getting that where I'm going with this. In another way, he's telling the people, I'm the donkey, the donkey need to die. I'm the lamb of God. I'm going to put my life so the donkey can live. But the question, who's the donkey? The donkey is actually you and I. He said, instead of you dying, I'm putting my life on the front line. That's why I'm going to ride on this day, the day where the Jew people need to go to the market to select the best lamb that they're going to offer to God. Actually, I'm here. You don't need to go anywhere. Select me. I'm going to go, and I'm going to die for you. Your life, you can keep it. And they rejoice. And this also shows the identity, the identity of Christ, being a man of humanity and just being a nice God. Jesus was just amazing. It was just amazing. And he did it. He said, instead of the donkey to die, which is the image of you and I, he said, you know what? You can stay alive. And then I'm going to be the Lamb of God, the perfect one, the one that you, all of you, are going to receive in your house. And I'm going to be there with you for three days. And then, by the way, I'm going to go to the temple. They, all the higher priests, they will check me. And then you know what's going to happen? And I'm going to be dying. Because three higher priests need to check the lamb to make sure that the lamb is perfect from inside and out and to be crucified. You and I, we're going to agree that Jesus was checked also three times as the lamb of God and the crucified too. This is what's happening to the donkey. This is why he chose the donkey. Because I need to finish. Let's talk about I. When we get to verse 20. Now, this is where everything changed from verse 20 to the verse 23. And I'm going to be very fast and we're going to live in this place now. The, this portion, only John is talking about it. John is talking about that there was a, a group of Greek people. They were Greek. They come to Jerusalem and they, they decided to go see Philip. And then they tell Philip what? Can we see Jesus? I ask myself a question. And the Bible is telling us Philip from Bethany. Now, you need to understand that Bethany is the other side of the Lake of Galilee. And the majority of the people that they were living to the other side were Gentiles. Even though Philip, he was a Jew person, he was a Jew, but Philip had a Greek name. His name is actually a Greek name. Now, I mean, those Greek people, when they come close to Jesus, I don't know how many people they were there, 20, 50 million people that were next to Jesus, they heard that one of the disciples of Jesus, his name is actually Philip. You know what they thought in their mind? They said, this must be our brother. This is one of us. That's why they went to him and I love their question. He was, can you help us to see Jesus? Today I want to encourage somebody. There's a many reasons why people are coming close to you. People that went close to Philip because they thought that he was one of them because of his name. There's many reasons that people come close to you. But can you show them Jesus? Do you know that many people come close to me, patients, because I have an accent? I don't know how many times people come to me. Hey, where you come from? Big mistake. Because when you ask me that question, I'll tell you I'm from Congo, I'm a Christian, and this, and where you come from, and then let's talk about the Bible. Do you know how many times I was bothered by that? By me having an accent? I'm going to open that today to you. Do you know how many times I struggle with uh, the language? I didn't really like it. I did everything. I was struggling with the language. I was struggling with my accent before I realized, no, no, no. 
This is actually a tool that God used. A lot of people come to me and ask me the simple question, where I came from because of the accident, and that can lead to something else. Do you want me to tell you the truth? I became a part of this church because somebody I met, he noticed that I was different. This is John Addington. And they asked me a question, where you come from? We start talking about me and they told me about the church. And finally, I want to visit this church. And this church became a huge blessing to me. Do you know how many people they come to you and they ask you a simple question? How did you do that to raise your kids like this? Don't tell them about you. The truth is they're asking you. Can you show us Jesus? Do you know how many people they come close to you just because you manage very well your money? They're just trying to understand how you did it. That is the opportunity to show for you to show them Jesus. Do you know how many people come next to you because you have an amazing voice? Or maybe you're a good looking person. Maybe you're seven feet tall. They're just coming to you because of that. This is the opportunity for you to show them Jesus. When is it coming? They, this is the greatest need of humanity. They need Jesus. When they're coming, the great people, maybe they were following Yahweh already. I have no idea. But they come and they say to Philip, can you show us Jesus? All I'm trying to tell you, there's many reasons why people are coming to you. But can you take that opportunity to show them Jesus? Can you take your problems that is attracting people to you to show them Jesus? I'm going to finish the, to tell you a testimony which is actually a reality is that I was a youth pastor here and the God decided to call me as a pastor. We decided to leave. We were here. Pastor Carl blessed us. The whole church prayed for us. We left. We went to plant a church. And there were about 25 of us. And then we went. And then we started building, working hard. As you know, church planted with all the up and down. But I just noticed one thing that we are about 100 and 150 of us because everybody don't come at the same time. But you know how the church works in the United States. But there's also another thing that we did an Easter Sunday. We have about 250 people coming. And then we were sitting there. I was reflecting about it. I was reflecting about something that's happening in the church. 60, 55% to 60% of the church are Hispanic. 35 are Caucasian. And the 15% are African-American. Now, I was sitting in a corner. And I'm thinking, because I consider myself as the other, I'm not part of all the group that I mentioned here. And I was sitting there and asking myself a question, God, why, how this happened? This is where I got the answer for what I told you about my accent. I realized that the majority of the people think that I'm an outsider. And then the majority of people, they are very attracted to my accent before they realize how weird I am. People come. And the God does that. I say, I use what you were complaining about it to bring people next to you for the glory, for my glory. But patient, you have only one duty. Show them Jesus. I didn't call you to tell them about your business, about how to, can you just show them Jesus? This week, I don't know who's going to come next to you to ask you a question. How, why you dance so well? Why you always dress very well? Why you, your color, your hair is always amazing? This is the opportunity for you to show them Jesus. Let's pray. Yahweh, we bless you. We bless you for being our God. We bless you for coming on earth and taking our place and dying for us. God, we bless you because you fulfill all the prophecies, Yahweh. God, we bless you because you are really the king who decided to deal with our insight first before to deal with everything that was happening around us, even though we know you're taking care of it because you are Jehovah Jara, the provider who provides every area of our life, Yahweh. Today we bless you, Yahweh God. We're making ourselves available to be used by you. God, give us the ability and the capacity when, when people are approaching us, Yahweh, we don't need to show them anything else than to show them Jesus, Yahweh. We bless you for who you are, God. God, thank you for this amazing church. Yahweh, we bless you for our pastor, Pastor Carl, Yahweh. Where he is, Yahweh, God, allow him to rest and to enjoy his family, Yahweh, until you bring him back in town again. God, I pray for everybody else at this place that they have questions. My prayer, can you be just the answer? God, I pray for everybody that they have a problem, Yahweh. My prayer, can you be the solution, Yahweh? God, I'm praying for everybody that they are lost, Yahweh. Can you be the way? 
that we glorify your name for who you are. Because there is no God like you. That's why we bless you. That's why we say thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.